Good day to you. Do you know the significance of this building right here at East Stroudsburg University? Oh yeah, that's the uh, residence hall that's getting rebuilt, right? Nobody's living in. It's going to be refurbished next year. Actually, at the top, you can see the WESS radio antenna, right? But what exactly is the name? Yeah, the name is the is the Lenape Residence Hall. But is it Lenape? Isn't it Lenape? Yeah, because that's a name that comes from a Native American nation that used to live here in the Poconos. A Native American nation that, can you believe, that's it's like the only vestige of them that's left. A name of a building. I mean, there's not even any, any insignia on the building to commemorate imagery of Native Americans. You know, people um, fishing or people hunting or canoeing. Uh, there's no placard over there with the history of the Lenape Indians, as they were called back then. And it speaks to a very unfortunate, in my opinion, common occurrence in the United States that we have very little knowledge of our indigenous American population, not only here in the United States, but also in Canada and Mexico. Although in Mexico, you do see indigenous peoples who are walking around in the streets. They look like indigenous peoples. They look like they have, have lived in the 1500s. And you still see their presence in Mexican society. They're often selling things. Unfortunately, sometimes they're begging for things or the children are selling chiclets, but you, but you see them embedded in Mexican culture. And similarly in Canada, Canada didn't quite have the same history as we did in the United States with, with uh, its indigenous population in terms of the brutality, forcing them onto reservations. But you, you also have in, in Canada where the populations of indigenous Canadians are living in their own community similar to the U.S. So I'm starting class today with this idea of indigenous populations because today's class on intercultural communication, chapter seven, is really all about learning about the United States. It's about learning about United States culture. And in fact, the chapter is called Dominant U.S. Cultural Patterns. So let's take a good hard look at our culture today. And we do start with the Native Americans and probably the most, the most uh, prevalent Native American population is thought of in terms of its, of its progress and its intellect and its ability to organize society is the Iroquois Indians. The Iroquois Indians, they were living here in the, in the northern eastern part of the United States. And oddly enough, well, maybe not oddly, but by today's standards, oddly enough, the name of the Iroquois Indians was given to them by their enemies, the, the white settlers. And so the enemies named the Iroquois after rattlesnakes. And just think about that, being, named, being known in the language that's a currency of your nation by a name that your enemy has given you. They, they were known as rattlesnakes. But to the Iroquois, they called themselves people of the long house, which had to do with something with the, the kind of um, uh, domicile that they would construct, I'm sure. Whereas like Navajos in, the, in Arizona, New Mexico, they lived in the side of mountains. The Iroquois were building houses. And the Iroquois did have a system of government. It was called the Iroquois League. And that league was designed to maintain peace and to resolve disputes. And unique to the Iroquois nation, as they called themselves, is when they would have conflict with another nation like Lenape or Shawnee, another residence hall here at ESU, or Hawthorne, another residence hall here at ESU, they would absorb, they would absorb that culture into their own, kind of like the United States, right? We have an American culture, but it's really made up of, of Europeans and African Americans and Hispanics and so on. So speaking of Europeans, let's move on to the next force that has influenced dominant, uh, dominant U.S. cultural patterns. And we're going to talk about the European Enlightenment. And the European Enlightenment has to do with a certain time period in the 1600s the 1700s where, where science was starting to be propelled instead of religion necessarily. I mention that because it's actually tied to an invention that's not talked about in the book called the Gutenberg Printing Press. The Gutenberg Printing Press made it possible for everybody, not just priests, to be able to read the Bible. And that then caused people to criticize the God that they were told they had to believe in, and scientific method resulted. And, and people who were doing scientific research, that is examining things and, and basing your, your conclusions on empirical observations, that method then started to be printed in books and then circulated to the masses of people because of the Gutenberg printing press. It made, books before then had to be written by hand. All right, that's, that's kind of a diversion. I just want to set up uh, some context for you there. So anyway, the European Enlightenment period is what we credit our country as having, uh, for having as, as um, 
I, my, my wording is kind of backwards here. What I'm trying to say is the European Enlightenment brought to us here in the United States the scientific method, which we use. We use it all the time, like po presidential polling, scientific method. It brought to us the European Enlightenment, it brought to us democracy. The eye of, de de of democracy was actually born in age, ancient Greece. And it brought to us capitalism. Originally, it was mercantilism, you know, the idea of buying and selling goods instead of bartering. Like, instead of saying, I'm going to give you a snake for a pig. You, I want the pig. You can have my snake. Instead, we have a currency money that, where profit-making is allowed. Also, in this time period of the Euro European Enlightenment, we can consider that the Puritans uh, were the, the single most important group to have an influence on dominant U.S. cultural patterns. The Puritans were a group of um, devoutly religious Protestants. Uh, they wanted to worship in their own way, and they came from Holland, and they came from England. They sailed on the Mayflower. They landed in New England and Massachusetts. You can go see a reconstruction of the Mayflower flower up there. You can see a reconstruction of the camp, uh, the settlement, I should say, that the Puritans founded when they landed. You can see that how the Dutch made their beds differently from the English. Yeah, it's really interesting to go see it. It is recreated. But the Puritans brought with them a certain strict code, a strict code of morality, in their opinion, a lot of it based around sexuality. That's why you have the, sh the Scarlet Letter, if you know that book about the, the, the woman in the congregation who had an affair with the preacher and she was made to wear a letter uh, out, out of public humiliation while he, nothing happened to him. So the Puritans brought this kind of, of you know, purity to our culture. And it's, it's many reasons why we can't swear in mass media. It's why we are very uncomfortable with nudity in public. You know, the, this is, we can thank the Puritan um, mindset and, pro and and for also for the spread of Protestantism as the largest religion in the United States. So here on the East Coast, we can find Catholicism probably has a stronger influence. Uh, another wave of people to come to the United States, aside, aside from the Quakers, uh, the Puritans to help set up our culture, were the Quakers. Quakers came from England. We have a lot of Quakers here in Pennsylvania. They settled the Chesapeake Bay region. Actually, the Pocono Mountains were settled by the Quakers. That is why our resorts here are not really ostentatious. They're not resorts like you will find in Las Vegas or you will find in Atlantic City. You know, they, there's something a little bit more earthy about them here. And that's because Quakers, as part of their value system, they're not allowed to, to flaunt their public wealth. If they're going to take a vacation, it should be very humble. It should, they should have a degree of dignity to it. Um, so Quakers, we have all around here, right? Quaker town, right? Just down the road. So we can find that kind of, and you have a friend in Pennsylvania being friendly. That's coming from the Quaker uh, perspective on life. And then we also had a group of people, you know, there's no name for them because they weren't identified by religion. They came from Scotland, they came from Ireland, they came from Wales, they came here to work, they came here to be entrepreneurs, they came here for the coal mines. Wilkes-Barre, it's settled by, by, um, by Welsh people. Pittsburgh, settled by a lot of Scots. Andrew Carnegie, big Scottish person. I myself am Scottish. I have a very personal interest in this part of our history. And they came and they settled in the Appalachian region of the United States, even going all the way down to Tennessee. In fact, if you go to Tennessee, you can find pockets where you still have the Scottish accent that's being, that's the accent that you hear when people are speaking because their culture has remained so intact in the mountains of Tennessee. And then I just want to mention that there was a French philosopher who came here. His name is Alexis de Tocqueville. He decided to go around the United States, see what it was all about. And as he went around, he decided that the country was not really a country so much as it was a bunch of little nations. You got the California nation, the Texas nation, the Pennsylvania nation, and so on. So I think, find that still very interesting today, and I, I think it still, very, still holds true very much. Now let's talk about the forces that develop the dominant culture. You know, as we look around here, we look at the topography of this particular region. We can see, uh, you know, off in the, in the distance there, there's some beautiful mountains. Uh, let me see if I can bring them into focus. Yeah, a little bit hazy today. You might be able to see them. You know, the trees are out. Normally, you have a beautiful view of that mountain here from the pavilion outside of the Lenape building. You know, when you look at this region, what did it need to develop it to get to get goods from one area to another? It was the Erie Canal that came. The Erie Canal came, and it connected the Great Lakes to Chicago, and also it spurned canal building across the United States. If you go down to eastern Pennsylvania, down through Philadelphia, there's a canal that goes down through. There's a Lehigh Valley Canal. This is the way that goods were moved. Prior to that, it had to be on Conestoga wagons and horses and mules and donkeys. Now you can put goods on barges and bring them down. But the canals also started to lay out a grid for the United States that would eventually be built upon by the U.S. highway system. So that's another force that developed our culture. In the 1950s, 
uh, Dwight D. Eisenhower, the president, built the, quote, interstate highway system. And, and in a lot of ways, it really it really screwed us over. I mean, it was great that, that we had that interstate highway system. You know, it's, you, otherwise, you'd be driving on country roads to get from Philadelphia to Baltimore. But the problem is it was designed for vehicles at that time, which were large and lunky and, and could only do 55 miles an hour and be safe. And so you have these really deep curves and very narrow lanes and you know the interstate highways you go to europe and you drive on highways you know like the autobahn in germany where you can do unlimited speed and the and the highway is made out of recycled tires so it's nice and soft you know we're, we're way behind with our highway system but it had a big influence because it it really promoted the the use of the vehicle over the train and the vehicle was the was the primary means that we get about if you don't have a car in the united states you're a really unusual person and if you're in the suburbs, you just got to have one, which is where a lot of people live. Also, building our dominant culture, we have the, the uh, Immigration Restriction Act of 1924. It's the first time we started to say, hey, we're going to pay attention. Who's coming into the country? We're going to start to clamp down and make sure that people who are coming in meet certain requirements. They have to take a citizenship test, etc. They have to demonstrate that they have their own financial means. But most of all, they have to be American. They have to pass a test in the Constitution. And so we have a homogenization taking place, forcing people to become Americans who come here. And also we have the defeat of the South. We have the defeat of the South and the defeat of slavery. And in fact, I have to say, as much as I like this book, I'm very disappointed that it did not talk about slavery as one of the chief dominant influences when it talked about Puritans and Quakers. Yes, it's a very um, ugly period of our past, and it's very difficult to talk about today without sensibilities um, rising into the discussion, but that's necessary. We need to talk about this period of our history, in my, in my view. And we can say that slavery is responsible in many ways. We don't like what happened, but it's responsible for bringing African-American culture to the United States, which includes rhythm and blues. It includes today hip-hop. It's an outsized cultural form. If you just look at the percentage of African-Americans in the population overall, and you look at the popularity of that music form, it's much more popular. So there's always been an art form that African-Americans have contributed. And let's face it, they have really helped build our inner cities Inner cities are struggling in many areas with poverty, but African Americans, those are the people that help build, or at least energize those inner cities as they are today. So I just want to go on a little side tangent and mention that, more than mention it. Back to forces developing dominant culture, we also have to acknowledge some great historical events like the Great Depression. That brought us a social security system before the 1920s when the Great Depression was. If, if you didn't have a job and you didn't have use of your limbs because you're disabled, you're out of luck. You'd be begging. That's why we have that whole saying, handicapped. It comes from holding a cap in your hand in the 1920s, begging. So why do we still have signs around campus that say handicapped? They should say disabled. You know, it's, a, it's a demeaning term. Again, commentary. I'm offering a lot of commentary today. All right, let's move on now to value orientation theory. Value orientation theory was developed by two researchers called Cluckholm and Stroudbeck. And their idea was to develop a theory that would explain how values differ across the world and yet how some values are universal. So you look at the universal values, they are in play across every culture, but the way that those values are interpreted is differently. We're going to focus on the U.S. here. So we'll take a look at the first value, which is the human being's relationship to nature. Now, in the United States, it's an industrialized country, and what makes it unique is it is a very religious country, although religion, commitment to religion is going down and secularism is going up. But we are still a very religious country, and you can see that when you sneeze, somebody will tell you, God bless you. People tell you everything happens for a reason. People tell you you've got to use your God-given talents without ever asking you, oh, do you believe in God? I'm just going to say those things to you. So this is kind of... This is how the prism of religion presents itself. Uh, we also know that, uh, that science and technology is a factor in the way that we perceive the human being's relationship to nature outside of religion. And somehow science and technology are compatible. I have uh, professor friends here who are scientists, uh, astronomers, biologists, chemists, and they believe in a god. And that's always tough for me to reconcile as an atheist. I wonder how can you conceive that there's a God when you use a scientific method because the scientific method relies on empirical evidence. Um, God relies on a faith. Uh, those two seem to me incompatible to me. I'm just expressing myself so that you have some insight, if you don't already, into the, to the mindset of one particular atheist so you can see how that... Um, the interpretations filter through a person's mindset. Uh, but that's something that I struggle with. Also, we have, um, fitting in this category of the human being's relationship to nature, this whole dimension of materialism in our, in our culture. 
the idea that we'll go to the Wawa and we'll buy a coffee and we'll get a stir and we'll get a, a warmer so that, it, I mean, a, an insulator so that the cu cup doesn't burn our hands. We'll open a packet of sugar. We'll take a little plastic thing of cream. We'll pour it in there. We'll drink that coffee. And in 15 minutes, it's all gone. We're very satisfied. But all those things that we use to make the coffee, they are staying in the ground for 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, 100 years. It's basically saying that we value materialism over the destruction to nature. That it's more important to us to have our coffee, to be able to throw out our cell phones with our batteries, to be able to get rid of bottles, beer bottles, by throwing them on people's lawns. You know, this, you know, this is, this is a, an extension of capitalism. It's an extension of capitalism saying that material goods are more valuable necessarily than the surroundings. It's not an absolute relationship. Of course, we have manufacturers trying to make recycled goods, and we have manufacturers trying to make goods that, that will go biologically, will biodegrade into the ground. But overall, you know, we, we, we value having things um, over having nature in some ways. That fits into our relationship with nature. Next up as a value is the, quote, modality of human activity. In other words, how do we spend what we're doing with our activity? What is our activity? Is your activity this most of the day? Is your activity this? I bet it's this. I bet it's not much of this. Because this is introspection. This is focusing on self-improvement. This is thinking of ways that make sense about life. Whereas this is getting through the next conversation, is surfing the web, it's making purchases, it's, it's posting photos about yourself. So human activity gets into how do we spend our activity? Are we playing? Are we having fun? Well, yeah, we're doing that on the phone, video gaming, so that's, that's that, the phone presents that. Are we expressing ourselves, or are we mostly taking it in? Are you expressing yourself through painting, through writing, through singing, through having a radio show, through sports? And finally, work. What's it like to work in the United States? Well, compared to the rest of the world, it's not too much fun, unless you look at Mexico, of course, where people work for six days a week, really five and a half. They work half of Saturday. But here in the United States, it's kind of said that we work all the time. And, to, and legally, we, most people only get two weeks of vacation a year. Whereas Europeans, by law, by law, most Europeans are getting five weeks of vacation a year. Five weeks versus two weeks. Because Europeans have discovered that when a person gets enough vacation time, they feel energized and they work harder. Whereas a person who doesn't get enough vacation time, they, they get lazy, they're fatigued, and they start to steal that time back. They, they go in their office, close their door. They come in late. They call in personal days. There's actually a day in October that the Europeans, uh, that, that there's a movement in the United States started to it's like take back our vacation day. And it's in October. And on that day, for the rest of the year, Europeans have the whole time off compared to how much work we put in. And on the rest of that day, we have to work all the way until we get to Christmas before we have satisfied the work equip equivalent that's expected in our country. So, and then Europeans have a saying. They say, you know, you Americans, you live to work, but we work to live. So just think about that. Next up is something called, as a value, the temporal focus on life. I'm not going to spend any time on this because we've already discussed it in, in multiple examples with Lebanon and Mexico. It's about how people perceive time in the United States. You know, you we go by the clock. Morning. We go by the clock. Uh, even your quiz in this class, right? Very U.S. thing. You're being timed. Oh, no, that's not this quiz. Yeah, that's this class. You're taking a quiz and you're being timed. Five minutes. You know, it's, we operate according to the clock. Next up is the dimension called char the character of the innate human nature. Character, not the character of innate human nature. How do we perceive human beings to be by birth? Do we perceive them to be good or do we perceive them to be bad? Religion seems to imply. I, I'm doing a lot of commentary on religion because, you know, to be an atheist really is a minority, has a minority portion of the, of the na national discourse in the United States. So to me, it's important to at least present that so that people who haven't been exposed to it before have an experience of it. And so when I try to think of this idea of the innate character of a human being, it seems to me that religion presents the innate character of a human being. A person is automatically bad. That's what the whole concept of sin is based around, right? We are all sinners. You hear that when you talk about religion. So it means we start out bad and we need God to make us good. Um, that's endemic to our culture. Other cultures start out with the human being is good. Another dimension of the character of our innate human nature is rationality. Are we rational? 
do we think about things in a logical sense? Yeah, it relates back to religion, but it also speaks to emotion, or are we very emotional? Um, we do tend to be very rational in this culture. And then finally is mutability, our ability to change. So I'm going to bring that up in the next point because the next thing, the next value that we're going to talk about is called the relationship of the individual to others. And we have already well established that we are a very individualistic culture, so we already know about that. But what about other dimensions like self-motivation? Well, yeah, we pride ourselves on self-motivation. I was looking at a Facebook post yesterday from a friend. He said he was reading a book on his deck. And then, the, then there was the inevitable question that came in as a comment on his Facebook. What book are you reading? And I had guessed before I read it what it was going to be. And, and I happened to be right. Not right that often, but in this case I was. And the book was a self-help motivational book on success strategies in the business world. And that's a very common thing that we seek. We seek self-motivation. Go look around in a bookshop sometime and you'll see a whole aisle dedicated to self-motivation books. Also fitting in with the relationship of the individual to others is hyper-individualism, um, also known as egoism. How much do we focus um, our relationship with others on ourselves? Do a little test today. Try and catch yourself, of all the times that you have conversations today, try and catch yourself how many times you're starting sentences with the word I. If a person says what they're doing, how many times do you try to relate to them by saying, oh, I... That is what I'm talking about here. That's egoism. It's forcing it back on us. We're taught to do that. We're taught to sell ourselves in interviews, for example. We're taught to get what you want. Even the construction of our English language has the I letter starting first. My colleague, Jem Zaitnoglu, professor in my department, says the Turkish language is not constructed that way. That's where he's from, Turkey. You don't start with I. English language does. And then we have equality. And equality is still fitting in relationship of us towards others. And that has to do with, do we try to, to correct equality in our country? Uh, to some extent, we, we do. But we are very comfortable having disparate, um, we, uh, having big differences between poor and rich because we want to have that rich as a model for what people can strive to achieve. We have the, the mythology in our country that anybody can grow up to be rich. And it really is true. When I say mythology, I don't mean that it's fake. I just mean it's something that we speak to and it becomes a kind of teaching uh, lesson for us. And then finally, we have conformity, what's known as conformity. Um, the individual versus other people. Do we generally try to be individual or do we try to be like others? You know, there's a lot of conformity that goes on in the United States. You're not wearing Kmart jeans in class, for example. Um, most people have a tremendous pressure, uh, pressure to have an iPhone over a droid. When I ask my class how many people have iPhones, it's more than 90% all the time. Tremendous pressure to be like others. My friend used to have a saying, the United States is a place where everybody has the freedom to choose to be like everybody else. I think that's a very interesting statement. You can think about that. Not to say that there isn't individuality, not to say that there isn't somebody in the audience who's dyed their hair blue or somebody who eats jelly beans and peanut butter, you know, whatever it is. But overall, what is the pressure to conformity? And that has to do with this element of mutability that I said I would revisit change. Are we willing to change? Yeah, in our country, we do like change when it's progress, but when it comes to changing whether we should fit in, that's something that we struggle with. All right, so for the last part of this, I'm going to just start to take a walk now, head over to an appointment that I have with the provost. And this final point has to do with forces that are also at the same time happening in our culture that are pushing us towards a regional culture. Ooh, sorry about the sunlight here. So, yeah... We do have forces propelling us towards a national culture, but also towards a regional culture. So one is we have a lot of regional and commercial centers that are growing up in the country. You know, really strong business centers like Silicon Valley or like Seattle, which is known for Starbucks and Boeing. Or like Amazon is looking for a place to go right now. They haven't selected where they're going to go. They build a big warehouse somewhere out here on the East Coast. And when they do, that's going to become a regional center. So that's one reason why we have the Atlantic region, the southern region, the western region, and so on. Also, we have immigration. Immigration, we have different peoples from around the world who have gone to different parts of the United States. Here in the U.S., here, uh, here in Pennsylvania, we have a lot of, of uh, Italian immigrants. We have a lot of German immigrants. We are increasingly having Hispanic immigrants coming from Puerto Rico, the Dominican, to some extent Mexico. But you find pockets of, of different immigrants in different areas. Like you find a lot of Chinese immigrants in San Francisco because they built the railroads out in California. 
Uh, you find a lot of Hispanics in the south. You don't find so many up here in the north, especially when you get into rural parts of the population. But that's not true in Texas. You find a lot of Hispanics. So immigration has helped to regionalize the United States. And then we have also the rise of special interest media. Just look at your cable channel. If you're just a golf fan, I'm playing golf today. If you're just a golf fan, there's a whole channel just for you. Isn't that amazing? And if you are a person who just wants to watch Spanish-speaking media, you've got Telemundo, Telemundo out of New York, or Univision out of Miami, Florida, and you can watch just Hispanic programming and telenovelas, if you know what they are, soap operas. So special interest media have helped to create pockets, pockets of regions in the United States. And finally, air transportation has made it much easier to travel to foreign countries. So in just a few weeks, I'll be traveling to Sweden with my class, Comparative Media, and we'll be flying on Iceland Airways. Very, very cheap. It's only costing us $600 per flight, and that's really great in the middle of the summer to fly to Europe. And so people now, instead of setting their sights on driving across the country to go see, to go see uh, the Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco or, or to go see the Grand Canyon in Arizona or the Arch in St. Louis... Um, that's not as desirable as it once was because people today they are now saying hey Cancun it's within reach or England I've always wanted to go there so we're not getting to know in essence our culture as much through airplane travel as we did in the past so that wraps up a little a little uh you know I guess you could say commentary combined with lecture on our dominant U.S. cultural patterns right here in the United States have a great day